since the beginning of time, man has been using the animal as a beast of burden in a semi-cooperative fashion. Whether it was Hannibal with his conquering elephants or drug-sniffing police dogs, this strange and sometimes one-sided teamwork can take on many forms. Hi folks, I'm Angelo Viola. On today's Outdoor Journal Adventure, we're going to look at a classic example of how this co-op can work. I'm coming to you from the intoxicatingly beautiful country of Morocco. Exotic ports of call, the magnificent Sahara Desert, and of course, Casablanca, probably the world's most famous movie backdrop of all times. But I'm going to forego these sites. I find myself in Agadir, a city just outside of the Atlas Mountains where we're about to take a treacherous 4x4 ride into the mountains in search of a 150-year-old beehive with over 70 million African honeybees. Then we'll go up to Algonquin Park, Canada on today's Off the Beaten Path report where Reno shows us another form of co-op between man and animal. Reno? Hey Edge, what could be more fun than a barrel of monkeys? Well I'm going to tell you, a sled full of dogs is probably the way to go. Hey, and if you should come back and join me, I'm going to show you how we have a howl of a time. Atta boy. You guys ready to go? Hey, Reno, I hope those dogs quieten down for you before you start your segment. Now on Surviving the Outdoors, Pete Bowman reports to us from Peru where he's trying to cooperate with Mother Nature. Pete? Hey, Edge. Remember the other day you told me to get lost? Well, my friend, your wish came true. I'm lost. I got a compass. I got a watch. I got a stick, I got some rocks, and I got to get the heck out of here. Looks like another great show, guys. So, in the immortal words of Humphrey Bogart himself, play it again, Sham. It's time for this week's Outdoor Journal. The Outdoor Journal. Brought to you by Shimano. Geared for performance. My adventure begins at the ultra-modern Agadir Airport. At first sight, you might wonder why such a futuristic city has been built in a landscape that seems so primeval. You see, in 1960, this entire town was leveled, and over 15,000 of its inhabitants were killed by a devastating earthquake. Today, due to its incredible climate and magnificent five-star resorts like the Beltour, Agadir has become the mecca for sunseekers from all over the world. But I'm not here for a vacation. I'm looking for information that'll lead me to the whereabouts of the world's biggest and possibly oldest beehive hidden somewhere in the Atlas Mountains. As I soon found out, this wasn't going to be easy. But eventually, using broken English, French, and Italian, I got the information I needed to find the tiny village of Inzerkate in the massif of the Grand Atlas. The friendly Moroccan people are steeped in tradition and culture. So after I received my directions, it was imperative that I partake in the traditional drinking of mint tea. To refuse is unthinkable. The old man told me to travel northeast to the territory of Ida Uzikiki, the Berber beekeepers. He said the first hundred or so kilometers would be on a paved road in fairly good shape, but from there on in, I'd be traveling an old path that would take me up to the center of the plateau where the 150-year-old beehive hung on the side of the Atlas Mountains. So far, so good. Now, in the meantime, let's see how Reno's making out with those dogs on this week's Off the Beaten Path report. Frequent flight destination, Toronto, Ontario. Algonquin Park's East Gate is approximately a three-hour drive northeast of Toronto. Ontario's oldest provincial park, Algonquin, stretches across some 7,000 square kilometers of beautiful lakes, forests, bogs, rivers, cliffs, and beaches. The springtime offers blossoms galore and the best moose viewing in the province. Hi, 
Hi everyone, today I'm in Algonquin Park, one of the remotest areas of Canada, and I'm en route to an old trapper's cabin which was built around 1914. To get there, I'm going to use one of the oldest forms of transportation, the dog team. But before we get on our trail, let's join John and get the rules and regulations so we have a safe and successful journey. Hey John. Hi there, Reno. Good, how's it going? Good. Hi guys. So this is our team, huh? You got it. You all set? Well, I am, but I'm a little nervous, so what should I know about it? Maybe one good point is in the way you speak, voice. And that the, uh, the more excited your voice is, maybe uh, if you want to control them, you want to speak in a slower, deeper voice. That'll be hard for me then. A little heavier. Because a little I'm, heavier. I'm always a fast moving. Are you? Yeah, if you want to bring them down and slow them down, I always try and lower the voice and speak seriously. And if you're happy and you want to get them going, and maybe a little higher pitched voice. Come on, here we go. Do we need, do we need to yell at them? Does it be loud or? I think if you're talking all the time, sometimes you can tune them out. Okay. And uh, they're just going to stop listening. So I would save it for important times. All right. Well, is it real? Is it as difficult as I think it is? Or? No, not at all. Not at all. The great thing about this is that you're going to be working with them. And they're, they're, they want to run, run, run. So as long as you're just paying attention to them all and watching them, no problem at all. Well, you told me my secret command earlier on, so hey, I'm ready to go. All right, let's great. It. Let's go. But before we got underway, Lil would show us the ropes and give me a quick impossible bone-saving lesson should I have any problems with the team and the sled. After knowing exactly how to properly harness the boys and feeling that we were comfortable making the trek without any discomfort, we were off. Okay, okay, boys, pick it up. Pick it up. And what a ride it turned out to be. A rush like this is akin to the feeling you get when you've accomplished a feat that you didn't think you could normally achieve. Our final destination was only a few kilometers off the main road, but my mind kept wandering back to the explorer days when this type of trip was an everyday necessity in order to survive, and to how our short trek would be considered a warm-up compared to the hundreds of miles of trailblazing that the early settlers to this area must have logged. Whoa, boys, whoa. Now, the sled itself is pretty easy to operate. It's got a brake and, of course, the commands that keep the dogs in line at most times. The only thing you got to watch in a downhill situation is that you don't actually run into the dogs because there's nothing solid between you and the animals. Now these particular dogs are just excellent and they respond to whatever you ask them to do. Then before we knew it, we were there, the island. This particular island is one of Algonquin's oldest canoe camps and was originally built around 1914. No electricity or running water is part of the charm of the setting and traces of yesteryear were evident everywhere. From ice saws and clamps which were used to store winter ice through the summer to the wood-burning fireplaces. This place oozed history. Most of these ones here are all sleeping cabins. It's really used mostly in the summer when we're not here as an outpost for canoe tripping. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. And we use it the rest of the year for our wilderness trips for everybody. Now, you operate out of here just in the wintertime? We operate here September till June. We do a lot of fall trips in here, uh -huh. spring trips, and uh, this is our winter base camp. Look at that, the fireplace is going. Yeah, all the ice. Fireplace going, coffee's on. That's the place for me to spend some quality time. I'm coming. That's it for the pavement. From here on in, folks, is nothing but rock, gravel, and sand. You know, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if I was, oh, maybe a, one car out of a handful that have even been in here this year. Let's rock on. Here we go. To say this road is narrow and windy is kind of like saying having a root canal done may be a little painful. Major understatement, folks. But the real problem here isn't the gravelly road. It's the scenery. This is no place for the early morning rush hour rubbernecker. Eyes here should be placed firmly straight ahead. 
But how can he help not throwing the odd glance over the edge at that incredible landscape below? What a view! Green valley, spectacular ravines, and gorges that just never end. Man, it's almost too overwhelming. Let me get back to my driving. I don't want to take a walk on a wild side over one of these edges. Even if my cell phone did work up here, I don't think 911 could help me. If hot, desolate, steep terrain is what's needed for creating the ideal beehive, then these boys out here have hit the mother load. Woo! <laughs> What a scorcher. You know, it's a wonder that anybody can survive out here at all. With an average temperature of just over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, almost zero rainfall. In fact, this tiny stream that we're looking at here is just a byproduct of a rainfall that happened about two weeks ago, and that's about it for the last decade. But they do tell me that at the end of this road, there's a tiny village that definitely has life. In fact, it has over 70 million inhabitants, as we'll see a little bit later on in the program. But first, let's catch up with Pete Bowman on today's Surviving the Outdoors. My flight destination was Lima, Peru. Most tourists visiting Peru need only a valid passport and return passage. No visa is required for visits up to 90 days. Currency unit is the Nuevo Sol. Geographically, Peru is divided into three distinct regions a narrow coastal strip of desert, the Andean Sierra, and the jungle. A yellow fever vaccination and preventative malaria therapy are strongly recommended for travelers going into the central and southern jungles. The peak tour season is late June to early September. I've never been lost before in my life. Help me, somebody. I've got hordes from yelling help so much. I can't believe it. If I had a phone right now, I'd call 911. Whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> kind of pushing the panic button here lately. As like I said earlier, I'm lost. It's, it's a guaranteed done deal. I'm lost. Luckily today, though, I have a lost individual's dream come true, the good old compass. Now, simply by knowing how to use a compass and knowing which way I got to go. Now, today, I know I got to go south. I should be able to get out of here. I got to set up my compass. The north with the red arrow, south is that way. I know that for a fact. What happens though, when you come out to the field, you're out taking pictures, you're doing whatever, you get lost and you have no compass. Well, there's a couple of really neat techniques you can use. This baby right here can help you big time. In this day of digital this and computerized that, I still prefer an analog watch. That's the one with the hands on it. It looks better to me and it comes in handy out in the field. I gotta show you this technique and it's really cool and you'll like it and you'll use it if you're lost. You take the hour hand of an analog watch. Now, I have to turn a bit. The sun is right here. It's above my head right here. I have to point that hour hand at the sun. So it's right there. It's dead on that sun right now. You take, now you look at 12 o'clock position, okay? Find the halfway point between the hour hand and the 12 o'clock position, and that's due south. Now, if you remember earlier, I'll get the compass out, but if you remember earlier, south was that way. So I'll go with the compass. South is that way. Our hand is right there, south is that way. This thing works every time, it's unbelievable. Now, I got another daytime technique, I'm gonna go, I have to go set it up. I'll show you two nighttime techniques and we'll get over there and we'll find another unlost position. Getting lost is never fun, especially at night. But there are ways of keeping hope in your quest for home sweet home. The first is locating the North Star. Take the two outermost away from the handle stars of the Big Dipper and extend a line straight out. It should connect with the last star on the handle of the Little Dipper, which is the North Star, showing you true north. The next method needs two sticks, one longer than the other. Shove both sticks into the ground with the shortest one closest to you. Now, eyeball the tips of the sticks together with any star and wait. Since the Earth revolves, the stars will move. If your line star moves to the left, you're facing north. If it moves to the right, you're facing south. 
And if it moves down, you're looking west. <laughs> this terrain is absolutely phenomenal. Even if you are lost, you can just at least enjoy, enjoy your walk around the bush, around the desert or wherever you're in. This last technique, you thought the first one was kind of cool. This last one, for a daytime technique, is probably even better. You just lay that bag down there somewhere, stay there. You got the stick, as I said I had earlier in the show. About 12 to 14 inches is what you need. Three stones, three coins, three objects, three whatever, it doesn't really matter. You take this stick, okay? It's gotta be a sunny day, remember? It has to be a bright, sunny day for this technique to work, because you gotta work with shadow. You drill that stick into the ground, like so, so that I'm creating a shadow off of that. Okay, so far, so good. I'm gonna just clear that area out. I'm gonna take one of these stones, I'm gonna mark the tip of that shadow. Just like that. We're gonna leave that right there. Now, this technique takes a while. If you're gonna hurry to get unlost, you're euchred. You're gonna be lost for a long time. I'm gonna have to wait at least 15 minutes from now, and then I'm gonna have to redo this again. So we're gonna have to wait. And wait. And wait. And wait. And wait. But pretty soon. Okay, now check this out. You can tell when I started, the tip of the shadow was right there. I was right at the end of this rock. Now it's moved to there. So I'm gonna take the second rock now. Because the sun's moving, and that's creating that shadow to move. And I'm gonna set it on that. Actually, it's gone about 20 minutes. I should have waited 15 minutes. I could have put it right at the edge of that one, but that's okay. I sit there, and I'm gonna wait some more. And wait. And wait. 500, yeah, 500. Yeah, right. And wait. 500. And wait. And finally, are you still with me, folks? Let's do it one more time. See the shadow now again has moved? I put, actually, I put the rock like that, to that spot. Now, we know it's progressed from here to here to here. It's going this way, so I'm gonna draw an arrow, like that, and that should be due east. Now, I'm gonna get the old compass out here and try and verify that. Hopefully, this will work. Okay, you're gonna set up north. Look at this. North straight at me, south straight at you, west there, east, right with the arrow. Perfect. By knowing that you have to go south, like I have to go today, or east or west, now or north, you're out of there. And baby, I am out of here too. Happy that I have not lost anymore. All right, don't forget your compass, dummy. <laughs> See ya. looking at here folks is the world's largest and oldest beehive or bee hotel. It was built back in 1850 by the Berbers who believed that this tiny little corner in the Atlas Mountains was the perfect place to produce honey. And just like back then bees are brought in from all over this country up to 500 miles away. Why don't we go down and have a little closer inspection. What we're walking into here is, the, uh, is a little tiny village that's actually used by the beekeepers. Legend has it that um, a great holy man back in, in the early 1800s came to this area originally and designated it as the perfect place to put this beehive because for some geological reason, I'm sure, it actually gets sunlight twice, uh, twice a day. Here's one of the keepers now. Um, actually gets sunlight twice a day on the bees, first at sunup and throughout the whole arc of the uh, sun's movement across the sky. And then at the end of the day, it gets another burst of light right, uh, right on the beehive, which obviously is perfect for, uh, for uh, keeping the bees. This tiny little path is the only way in or out, which makes the donkey the vehicle of choice around here. Now this hive should be about 100% empty. Um, the hive actually holds bees three months out of the year, so this is the downtime. The bees are out, out in the fields and uh, collecting pollen and getting ready to get to be put back into the uh, hotel, as it were. But it's completely empty, because believe me, folks, I would be going nowhere near this if uh, there was a chance of there being 70 million bees in the area. Trust me on that one. 
So hopefully they'll be mostly gone. I've been told that there may be a few stragglers, but uh, certainly nothing to worry about. Let's get a little closer. Look at the size of that thing. That is an awesome sight. One of the things that really intrigues me about this place is how do they get the honey out without the convenience of paved roads? Hard to believe. Now, you can see all the little compartments in this, in this building. Each one of them holds crates, which in turn hold boxes. Each box holds approximately 7,000 African honeybees. And each one of those openings holds about 10 of those boxes. The entire structure as we see it, including the wing up on the top, holds 10,000 crates. If you add them all up, folks, we're talking 70 million bees. 70 million bees. Could you dig that? That ain't no little beehive. Now, here's those compartments I was talking about. You can see how they're designed. Well, designed as much designing as you're going to get back in 1850. But what they do, did and do, they slide these large cases of bees that contain 70,000 bees in the openings, and that's where they sit uh, for about three months while they develop the pollen and nectar into honey. Now, the clay that they use here is specifically there for a reason, and that is to hold the, the temperature within the hive, within each hive, uh, at a fairly uniform and constant temperature. Obviously, the top is there for shade. And this is the center of all the attention the African honeybee. They spend from August until April out in the lush green valleys collecting the pollen and nectar that will eventually be processed into honey. They live in self-contained little hives. Based on their location, each one of the villagers has designated a certain number of the hives for which they're responsible. I can just imagine what this must sound like in about another two months when they load it back up. In fact, what we've done with the help of our technicians, I asked them to uh, try and recreate the sound that 70 million bees would make. And this is what they came up with. <laughs> what a classic example of how man can cooperate with animal, not necessarily get the upper hand. In this case, I think it's clearly a draw. You see, most of the bees that are brought to this area come from areas that are quite arid and void of pollen and nectar. So they're definitely the winners as well, being released into a valley with so much sustenance for them. So in this case, let's call it a draw. Until next week, I'm Angelo Viola, coming to you from the magnificent Atlas Mountains in Morocco. I'm gonna check out before they check in. See you next week. <laughs>